Okay, everyone, I think we're going to get started with our new portion of the program. making it back after uh, kind of a long lunch and uh, you know not go back to your hotel room and take a nap and uh, so thanks for that and uh, thanks for bearing with us through this morning we're having a little sort of uh, we, we were accommodating the governor's schedule and we're bouncing in and out but uh, it was great sessions and appreciate everybody so um, this afternoon we're going to kind of continue on with uh, uh, our theme of energy but shift more and kind of some of the coal-related aspects and looking at some of uh, the trends and, and markets there. And our first uh, speaker this afternoon uh, is Mike Nassi. Mike is doing a quick dive bomb into uh, Jackson. I think he's going to be on the ground like three or four hours, something like that. And, but uh, uh, Mike uh, is, is an attorney with uh, Jackson Walker. It's a law firm in Austin, Texas. Um, he's been working on coal and regulatory issues for a long time. I have known Mike for a decade plus, sort of things. So, but he, he really is a, um, one of the preeminent experts on you know, air regulations, markets, yeah, clean power plan, um, things on those orders. So um, long time uh, uh, sort of lobbyist and doing things in the Texas legislature and sort of coal users in general. So. I'm really pleased to have Mike join us and talk a little bit about kind of regulatory impacts and markets and kind of the new state of the land. So, Mike, thanks. I can. Yeah. Great, everybody. Thank you. It is uh, exciting to be here, and I re truly regret only being here for, I think it's going to be a total of two hours. That's just <laughs> silly, right? Um, I am going to be back twice this, this uh, summer. I'm very excited. I love coming to Jackson and Wyoming generally and uh, bringing some Boy Scouts to hike up in some backcountry. And I sent them a picture that I took when I landed just now. And I said, here's how much snow has to melt. And you know, they've never seen that much snow in their lives, right? So what I'm going to do is it's going to pro probably set the table pretty good for the next two speakers. You've got two great speakers following me. Randy Imager is going to talk about things that EPA Energy Policy Network's doing in rate cases and administrative proceedings. Uh, and then Paul Griffith is going to, with, with Energy Fairness is going to talk about um, some really important work that he does uh, that's grassroots and, and, and engaging on the policy side. And I, I love partnering with both of those guys and do great work. So I'm going to dive in and I'm going to give you a couple hundred thousand pages of environmental regulatory briefing and litigation in two slides. Um, so that's going to be my uh, compassionate move for the day. I'm going to tell you what I think are the four most important environmental regulatory things that have happened for at least coal fired generation, um, and generally, I think, in energy policy, and then some critical hurdles that still exist um, that the administration is working with. But then I'm going to completely shift gears, and I'm going to tee up a little bit of what both Paul and, and Randy will talk about, which is the challenges that we see in our electricity markets in terms of being able to actually have consumers know what the true and total cost of the energy they're buying looks like. That is. The most fundamental problem with the electricity markets right now, I'm doing a lot of work on this, I'm an expert with some cases that Randy's involved in, and, I, and I'm an environmental regulatory lawyer and a utility lawyer, but I also am a frustrated father and teacher. I teach a class at the University of Texas Law School and at Rice, and I have three teenagers, and I have been blown away about the drop in energy IQ of our country, generally. And so I am directing an initiative called Life Power, and it is an educational initiative, and I have videos to show you so you don't have to listen to a lawyer talk for my entire slot. And I'm very excited because some of it profiles some of the most important work that's happening right here. We focus in one of the videos on the Petronova project, but obviously Petronova is very much tied at the hip with all of the exciting things that are going on at ITC and carbon capture. I've worked, I'm one of the founders and the general counsel of the carbon capture. Carbon, Clean Carbon Technology Foundation, so I've been working on CCUS issues for over 15 years. I'm very inspired by what Wyoming's done. I continue to be blown away about the leadership, and I'm one of these, and Jason's been instrumental in this, trying to remind our leadership of these natural linkages between Wyoming and Texas and North Dakota 
and this great trifecta that those states and others um, have. And so I'll dive in here. I'll give you your environmental regulatory. So anybody who needs CLE or just wants to um, get bored or have sleeping material later, this is four things. Um, they're going to be reviewed to most of you, but I'll, I, I want to make sure I do my job of saying what the current state of the regulation is. Um, obviously, the Congressional Review Act um, reversal of the OSM Street Protection Rule was a significant issue for those of you who know mining regulatory issues, and I do a lot of that in my career. Um, um, it was a significant problem rule. It was a rule designed to address a problem that, problem in quotes, that exists in Appalachia. It doesn't really exist in any measurable comparison anywhere else, clearly not in the Perfect Town River Basin, not in the lignite fields of the Gulf Coast, or for any lignite up in North Dakota, Montana. Yet we all got that regulation, and that regulation got functionally pulled back all the way, not even by the President, but by the Legislature of Congress, and the President signed it. Um, the Energy Independence Executive Order was a very big day um, for America, in my opinion, because it, it started a process of fundamental revisitation of all environmental regulatory activity to make sure that we were being sensitive to the priority of energy security and to make sure that our regulatory regimes are accountable. And I'm a big promoter of environmental law. Our environmental law has been a, a huge success globally. I will finish with that theme. I'm an environmental lawyer. I better say that, right? But I, I do think that people who don't understand why environmental law works often are subject to actually breaking environmental law in a way that destroys it. And that's what creates these huge pendulum swings politically, is the perception of whether or not a, a reform agenda is actually gutting environmental law, when all we're really doing is bringing environmental law back to where it works the best. And so then another big deal, especially for people who work in the CCUS front, was the Future Act. We have more work to do there. We're working on some things in D.C. right now. But clearly a very significant part of our ability to mitigate against climate issues and see the win-win opportunities that exist for CCUS projects was to make sure that the 45Q credit was extended and expanded and become more useful to developers, whether or not they have tax liability, so that they can broker it. We did something very similar to this reform of a credit in Texas. A lot of people don't know that Petronova really, if you ask the NRG developers and the Japanese, the big driving force of that, in addition to the partnership with DOE and the Japanese, was the state of Texas's participation in that project through the use of assignable and tradable credits. So the 45Q is an analog to that at the federal level, and I'm very excited about that. Um, obviously the Affordable Clean Energy Rule, the ACE Rule, which is replacing the Clean Power Plan, a central part of any good regulatory uh, reform agenda. Um, I think the Clean Power Plan is the poster child for how you take environmental law, perhaps with a laudable goal, and you destroy it by overgrowing the federal agency beyond its statutory and constitutional limits and it creates this backlash. Well, this rule is by no means a full swing in the other direction. It's not saying we're not regulating carbon under the Clean Air Act. It's not saying we're going to undo the endangerment, act, uh, endangerment finding. It's going to actually regulate carbon dioxide act power plants. It's just going to do so in the constraints of the statute and the Constitution. So it's the beginning. Obviously, they're considering comments now, and they'll finalize that rule here very soon. Four things that still have to happen that are significant for the existing coal fleet, and I won't linger on these, but I'll certainly field questions at the end if you guys want. Um, Ethylene limit guidelines, if you're an environmental regulatory geek like me, it's a big deal. It's a rule that is still lingering and creates significant risk. It's being used to justify attacks on existing plants. The coal combustion residual rule, also very dangerous rule for existing generation. Um, because of some deadlines, um, the D.C. Circuit just issued, just last week, issued a very favorable decision to at least allow EPA to go through a process of continuing to reform that rule before it dropped a hammer on a bunch of power plants. Um, but uh, things still need to be reformed in that rule for it to have its uh, full reform agenda accomplished. Fire particulate standard is a big controversial issue. It's a thing I've spent a lot of time in my life on, and I'm going to finish uh, talking about that, so I'll defer my discussion just to tell you that there was definitely some uh, interest within the lower level staff to try to keep driving that standard lower and lower, and the toxicological community generally, really no matter what party they vote in, um, believe that the standard at 12 micrograms per cubic meter is already, first of all, the most stringent in the world, and we achieved it, by the way, and I'll explain that and show you pictures of that. 
Um, but somehow the concept that lowering that would actually achieve health benefits. It's a very important controversial issue because if we keep on misstating the science about being able to achieve additional risk reduction below where we set our risk-based or health-based standards, we are not it's completely unaligned. When we say to the American people that the ozone standard will be X or the PM standard will be Y, because the Clean Air Act tells us to set that limit at a level that is safe for humans plus a measure of, of a margin of safety is the term of art, okay? Then we need to stand by that. We cannot, in every other rule that we promulgate, say that, well, if we kept on reducing PM lower, we would save hundreds of thousands of lives. That's what the last administration did. That's why most of their rules were completely overblown in terms of their benefits. 99% of the, of the health and economic benefits of the Obama air quality regime, 99% was from PM reductions below the next. PM reductions below the level at which we've already told the American people this level is safe for the world, I mean, for, for American people. And it is safe for American people because the toxicology tells us that. That's why the administration, the Obama administration, did not lower the standard. Well, knowing that that debate exists and that limit exists, you still have what I will call extreme environmental agenda-driven people that are looking to drive that standard lower. In the United States, the one country that still is a strong economic power that achieves that standard, as opposed to focusing internationally, and I'll talk about that at the end. And then finally, Clean Air Act regulation generally uh, of carbon dioxide needs to be dealt with. And there is a materiality component to the Clean Air Act. It requires you to be able to demonstrate if you're going to regulate and a pollutant under that act, you have to demonstrate that you're significantly contributing to the endangerment, and you're going to therefore significantly reduce the endangerment by regulating. That's not really what happens when you regulate CO2 from the United States, because all of our treaties, all of our regime that look to reduce carbon dioxide globally, look at a 2050 concentration. And the 2050 concentration of the U.S. based on EIA and the IPCC for the power sector is between 0.4 and 0.7 percent. That doesn't mean we need to stop to, you know, commercializing carbon capture technology. That tells us we need to get going on commercializing carbon capture technology because the reason the United States is such a tiny percentage of that global pool by 2050 is that the developing world is massively expanding its electrification and its own CO2 emissions. And so the work we do here and the work we do in Houston and in Bismarck and in Saskatchewan and everywhere where CCUS is being seriously deployed is the most important work because of that global growth, not because of the domestic. <coughs> and that's really important when you think back on how we should be regulating these things under the Clean Air Act. So that is a whirlwind through the regulatory process. And I'm gonna shift gears to talk about utility and electricity markets. Markets only work when consumers know what they're buying. Pretty basic statement. Most of us who took macroeconomics heard that, at least hopefully didn't fall asleep too many times in class like I did, but the reality is that that doesn't happen in electricity, okay? And the reason is because we have a shrouded set of costs that really are direct and indirect subsidies that consumers don't know about. This is not a speech to tell you that we shouldn't put a cost on clean or safe. It's just a statement that we don't have those costs available to, to uh, consumers. The first thing I'll say is a reminder of what I just said, which is when you're taking up a discussion about whether replacing a bunch of coal or even gas generation with renewable energy, this statistic has to be factored in. Are we really leading by retiring plants as opposed to retrofitting them with carbon capture? What are we leading? We're leading nothing. We're reducing nothing in terms of the global picture. This is not a pollutant that hurts people here other than my CO2 that I'm hurting you with now, okay? It is a pollutant that hurts people if it does because of its global interaction. We all know that. And so we have to think about that in terms of policy decisions down in Colorado. What are we going to lead by not building high efficiency uh, gas generation and 
retrofitting and making more efficient coal generation and commercializing CCUS. Who are we leading if we're not doing those things? We're not leading anybody. So it's really important to me every time we talk about the issue of using huge you know, mandates and initiatives to try to make ourselves feel better, all we're doing is making energy more expensive. Subsidizing and deploying today's renewable energy isn't helping the developing world. I'm all about renewable energy investment. I hope 20 years from now we're going to laugh at the renewable energy we're using now and that we'll have commercialized and much more efficient, less intermittent, more cost effective and affordable and less environmentally destructive suite of renewable options. But we don't have them now. So deploying those in mass scale and then depriving the CCUS research is not leadership. So I'm giving off this, the, the soapbox and I'll talk about the market issues. So once you get past the false premise of 100% renewable, let's talk about whether subsidies are known. We have billions of dollars of subsidies for renewable energy. There are subsidies for other sources of energy as well. We could have a long debate about whether they are the same kind of subsidies. Don't have that time right now, but I can tell you that some very good work has been done, and I'll share it with anyone who wants to email me, about the dollar per megawatt hour return on investment we get from subsidization. Okay, mitigating risk in the oil field or the gas field is a fundamentally different kind of subsidy than saying I'm going to put my thumb on the scale and make your product $23 cheaper in electricity markets that often rock around $5. Okay? We are destroying electricity markets. We are not building new power plants because pricing is so undercut by the subsidization of renewable energy, primarily when that it is keeping us from building high efficiency new plants, it's keeping us from investing and doing retrofit projects where we can actually commercialize technologies relevant to the rest of the world, and we're convincing ourselves this is all good. It's not helping, it's not helping the problem. There's no debate that I'm raging here about climate. It's a debate about math, okay, and leadership. So the second thing is that, or the third thing, that there's a disparity. We don't, we don't show people in their utility bills what these things cost. They're over there buried in their tax bills. We pay more taxes because of these subsidies. So when a person is making a decision, do I think I should have more renewable energy? I'm not, they're not making that decision based on how much it costs them in their utility bill. I'm not sure we'll ever solve that problem, but we definitely need to be talking about it. And if you look at all the regional and national groups that know a lot about electricity, they're studying that issue because they know that the price signals are distorted. So we're not getting rational decision making in the rate making process. Randy's gonna show you several examples of that, so I'll leave that to him. And then finally, there's all kinds of indirect subsidies in the electricity market that have to be counted for. In Texas, we spent $8 billion, that's a B, moving renewable energy from West Texas to our cities. Project that was celebrated, but the rate payers that are now having to pay literally twice as much for the transmission and distribution component of their electricity bills are wondering. The reason they're not raising up with pitchforks is because gas prices have been so low, coal and nuke have continued to be so low, that the energy price component of everybody's bill has dropped. So they're not getting hit that bad. But that bill is coming. We have to be really smart about the decisions we make long term because we impose those costs and we socialize them on the entire market. And that is a subsidy. It doesn't cost a renewable energy facility more to dispatch to the grid, even if it's located a thousand miles away. That is wrong. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't be doing those projects. We just need to price them accurately because our markets won't function rationally if we don't. And then ultimately, the issue of balancing these resources. Okay? I'm going to jump right to it and show you. Look at Georgetown, Texas. This isn't the nice little place in D.C. with the university. This is a nice little suburb of Austin where I live. And my father-in-law, a retiree, lives up there. And you know, as most retirees, they don't like it when their electricity bill goes up $120 in a year. If you want to know how 100% renewable looks in the real world, Google Georgetown, Texas. And the third, first thing you'll find is is the mayor, Republican, in Al Gore's movie, celebrating why this is going to save all kinds of money. And guess what? Even in the most competitive market in the country, with this massive wind and solar reserve, with massive subsidization of all of the above, their 
underwater on all of their renewable contracts, and they are now going to have to systematically recover from their ratepayers at least through a $100 increase per year for three or four years. It, I can't go into all the details now, but I can tell you this is a very relevant ex example for anybody in Colorado who wants to pay attention, and certainly anybody who's looking at the Green New Deal in Washington, D.C. All right, now I'm gonna shift to videos, okay? The Light Power Project is a project that's not designed to attack or point fingers. It's designed to actually raise the IQ of our country about energy, all energy. And so the first thing that we focused on was we want to see how many people actually understand all the stuff they use every day relies upon fossil energy. So you'll see three icons here, coal, natural <coughs> gas, and oil. And that's not to say that renewables and nuclear aren't a part of it, but if you look at the polling, these are the three biggest demons in the world, and yet every single American relies upon significant aspects of their life. You know, there are, there are statistics I could go through, but I will leave it to the video. The most important of which is, how many people actually know that half the oil that's produced is used to make products as opposed to transportation fuel? Okay, the stuff we use every day. So that's what this video is about. By the way, I got about a half a million uh, views in 24 hours when it went up. Hopefully we can make it really loud because it's really, my son said it's cool music. So I'm not affiliated with PragerU, just so you know. It's just they love that video, so they posted it and it got a bunch more views. But that's one video that you know I think is a, there, there's no harm done with that video. All we're doing is reminding people before you decide to rule out all these fuels, you might want to think about if you're not going to do if you're going to be able to live with all those different things. This next video is about energy poverty. And next slide. Could you go to the next slide on the deck just so I can give them a little introduction? Because there are some really important people in this video that a lot of people in this room know. Um, energy poverty to me is one of the most devastating uh, underperforming aspects of the energy IQ of America. How little people understand how big a problem this is globally. And as a human being, and, you know, frankly off the record as a man of faith, I, I'm, I'm blown away at the lack of empathy that we have in our country on this issue. So we're working hard to try to educate um, for everybody probably knows these folks, but Frank Clemente on top left, if you don't know Frank, he, he often doesn't talk about his personal story. His personal story is in this video for the first time. Bottom right, Irfan Ali, a, a familiar face to some in the room, um, takes a different perspective from the Pakistani perspective as, as, as he's personally seen projects get defunded that would have raised people out of energy poverty just because they had the F word, fossil energy. Associated. In the middle, Caleb Rosser, a professor at both American University and in Africa, he's not wearing an outfit because he's a tourist, that's what he wears when he teaches. He is a champion of the left. He was a major anti-apartheid movement, human rights advocate, and he is disgusted at international policies that seek to defund fossil energy because they deprive Africans of energy. 
And there's nothing wrong with trying to bring renewable energy to Africa. There is everything wrong with depriving them of energy if it's too expensive. And that is the problem that we have. And so this video goes to that. It's a little longer. It's as short as it possibly could be, but I hope you guys agree it was worth the effort. So let's take a look at that. It's about seven minutes. Energy problems, uh, these are two words, right? To me, life in itself without energy is poverty. Why? Because imagine trying to do what we do on a daily basis without energy. We would not be able to work, we would not be able to educate our kids, we would not be able to do anything without energy. Energy poverty is when you go talk to a grandmother in Swaziland and you realize inside that she's cooking and lighting and staying warm by a fire of some material in the middle of the hut. And you find out from her that the material is cow dung, dried cow dung. Over one billion people do not have any electricity. That's only the tip of the iceberg, about two and a half billion people only have limited access to electric power. And that's, so you're closing on ha almost half of the population of the world are living in energy poverty. And that's why I say it is the leading problem facing mankind today. Societies where people have, have access to energy, um, they survive childhood, they live longer, they eat better, they drink cleaner water, and they learn to read. There's roughly a billion people who live on the continent of Africa. That's about three times the population of the United States. Estimates are about 25%, let's say, uh, have access to electricity in their home. Uh, that means at night, if you look at the satellite picture of Africa to the south and Europe to the north, Europe is ablaze. People are out, factories can still run, uh, cars can still drive down the highways, children can do their homework, sitting with electric lights in their house. Um, you can be heating and cooking with electricity. Uh, in Africa, you will see literally a dark continent. And Africa's life expectancy is about 55 years per person. The United States is about 76, as are most developed countries. That's 20 years of life lost per person. Why do I say that's linked to electricity? Because electricity is what you use to clean water, to make sure you can drink the water without getting sick, without your kids getting diarrhea, dehydrating, and dying. Water is why Africa's infant mortality rate is about 80 kids out of 1,000 born die before their fifth birthday. In the United States, it's well under 10. Uh, clean water is the holy grail of African health and development. If you look at a map uh, at night of the Korean Peninsula, you see the great demarcation between South Korea and North Korea, where South Korea is powered by fossil fuels for the most part. North Korea is virtually dark. The children in North Korea, they're, they're shorter, they weigh less, they die sooner. They, these people all come from the same biological stock. My wife and I have four biological children. And then we adopted four children from overseas. They were adopted from Korea. Two of those children were adopted from South Korea and two were refugees from North Korea. When we adopted our son from North Korea, he was six years old and he weighed 35 pounds. I carried him across the parking lot at the airport like a baby. After 20 years of being involved in the United States, civilization, power, electricity, he became a United States Marine and won two medals for bravery under fire in Iraq. So that's what electricity can do for you. I saw it happen before my eyes. The experience of seeing an older gentleman who looked like my grandpa, uh, having spent an entire day gathering twigs and branches off all the trees, to take back to his hut and carry it back on his back. That was a very powerful experience. It taught me um, the reality of what energy poverty really is. And uh, if you fast forward to today and look at what is going on in terms of policies that are being conducted in Washington through the World Bank, 
or other lending institutions that have imposed these draconian restrictions on finance and projects that would have delivered electricity to people like that, um, it is really troublesome um, because there is no connection between the people that are perpetuating these policies and the ones that are actually suffering as a result of them. Fossil fuel is the only answer. Renewables are not going to get it done. Um, the wind doesn't always blow, as we all know, and the sun doesn't always shine, and this is not uh, a portable in many parts of the world. I think we need to connect those dots. We need to let people know that without fossil fuel in many parts of the world, there will continue to be abject poverty driven by lack of energy. People talk about we should have off-grid power for these nice little African communities. They don't need to be on a grid that links them to the rest of the nation. Just nice little off-grid power. Off-grid is no way to be part of the modern world. You need to be on-grid. And the only way to be on-grid is with coal-fired plants, uh, gas-fired, oil-fired plants. We can help make that energy clean. Well, if there's any country that should understand the benefits of electricity, it has to be the United States. I mean, the United States went with 100 years from basically a third world country to the most advanced civilization in the world. And what powered that? Electricity. And what powered the electricity? Fossil fuels. Oil, natural gas, and coal. We have the oil, we have the natural gas, and we have the coal. We have the technology, we have the established infrastructure, we have the transportation infrastructure to move the, these commodities and move them to the rest of the world. By denying these countries opportunities to get access to American energy, such as coal or natural gas, we are condemning people to lives of perpetual poverty. We're not only condemning people today, we're condemning their children. So what's important about um, what I'm about to show you is that's not the end of the story. Videos can only be so long. But the rest of the story is, okay, what about carbon? And so that's what's so important about the work that's being done here and, and shamelessly down Texas and up in North Dakota and in Saskatchewan and across the world. So the next video is a discussion of that very issue. And you'll see some, some imagery that's reflected and duplicated on purpose so that there's a linkage between these two. They have to be small segments. We're living in a short attention span theater world. But they are separate videos, but let's play this one and then we'll wrap. This may look like the past to you. There are many people in the world thinking about coal being on the decline in the U.S. But in fact, coal is growing globally in many underdeveloped countries around the world where population is going to continue to increase. This is an exciting place. This is the largest installation in the world of carbon capture utilization and storage. Just since 2010, 1,200 coal plants, just like the one I'm standing on, have been installed in the world. Technology like that that is behind me can be bolted on to coal plants all over the world. Gas plants eventually too. Well, this is the beginning of the carbon capture utilization and storage story here at this plant. What you see behind me is the duct work. And that duct work takes the blue gas over to the facility behind my shoulder, which is the Amines facility, where the CO2 is actually absorbed and removed from being an emission to the atmosphere. The magic of this is the capturing of that carbon dioxide that would ordinarily be an emission. We turn it into a product, put it into this pipeline, and 80 miles from here, there is an oil field making good use of this as a product. Domestically, CCUS is a no-brainer because it expands domestic oil production with CO2 from our coal and gas. Globally, CCUS is a game changer because the developing world will be a much bigger contributor than the U.S. to global CO2 concentrations moving forward. For developing nations who know fossil fuels are the only realistic way to address energy poverty, 
CCUS technology gives them a long-term carbon mitigation strategy that does not deprive human beings of affordable electricity now when they need it most. If we're able, as a society, to take technologies like this and adopt them globally, we've solved the problem through technology. Because that's what the world wants. Carbon capture, utilization, and storage. They don't want our ideology. So obviously, with the amount of technical expertise in the room, everybody would agree. That's a high-level overview of all of the issues. It's not the technology, but it is critically important that we put a dent in the public perception and ignorance, frankly, of how important this area of development is. So all I can say is thanks to everybody who does this work. And in my closing kind of sermon, I want to remind everybody of something that I am just frankly disgusted by, and that is, um, Nobody gives us the credit for what we've done already with technology. The United States is the cleanest economic superpower by a large margin, and nobody talks about it. And it happened because we developed technology, scrubber technologies, baghouse technologies. We are a shining success. Pittsburgh, Paris, we're spending all of our, our international chits arguing about climate. And you know from what I've told you and what we said there that I care about that. But why don't we care about the one pollutant we know kills more people in the world? Why don't we have an international agreement about a particular matter? Because it is not jazzy. It's not popular. It is a huge problem for our trade competitors. It's a huge problem for our allies. We are, that, that chart on the right, we are literally one of the cleanest of any country, and when you take out the peninsular and island nations and small nations, we are the cleanest. When it comes to the one pollutant, everybody agrees kills the most people. And yet, we trade and compete and negotiate with people who are much dirtier. So whatever we do in the great work that we're doing on carbon, we've got to do this business. Because we are exporting jobs and importing pollution. Half of the South Basin in LA's problem comes from Asia. 90% of the mercury that's deposited west of the Mississippi comes from Asia. No treaties, no negotiation, no leadership. So that's a little bit of something I care a lot about that I want to make sure we all remember, which is, and everybody in this room, I think, from knowing the people that I know are in here, has actually had a hand in that great success story. And this next evolution of technological you know, commercialization is going to be that next in a long series of examples. But we don't have to point aspirationally. We can prove to people we've done this before on things that seem very difficult. So thanks for the time. Thanks for all that you're doing. I'm sorry I have to do this whole drop in and drop out, but this issue is actually quite a big discussion right now back in DC, and so that's where I'm heading, and we're gonna tie it up there. But I will take questions. I'm sorry to break into Randy in, in, in my time, but if there's any questions, this is kind of your only chance for me. So good time for Two questions. Yes, back there. So I can ask a question. I see a lot of maybe you can hear me. So kudos to you for boldly proclaiming these, uh, these technologies and solutions. I've been working in the field of CCS for since 2003, and, and we've seen great advancements. And it's a it's not a technology problem; it's a motivation problem. My question for you, though, is is more of a policy. The, the story of what we're doing and what we've done and where we can go in the short term is being drowned out by others who are, it's a uh, um, all or nothing kind of story, which is, it's not about clean coal, it's about no coal. It's not about clean fossil fuels at all. It's about no fossil fuels. How do we combat that, the social media, the, uh, the next generation coming up, the and, uh, deal with that on, on a broader basis. Because you have a captive audience here. I mean, I, I don't stand up and share and, and yeah. what you're saying, but when I talk to the young folks, that penetration is very, very difficult, and they're the ones who are gonna be motivating the decisions. Yeah, that's a great question. It's the whole reason, you know, you've got a environmental regulatory lawyer who's like a convert in doing videos, right? Because if you look at polling, and I'm no polling expert, but some of the best political pollsters on both sides of the spectrum are working on a joint project right now, and it is shocking how few Americans, even older Americans, even understand this, or even know it. And once they know it, and once they know that X percent of a given state's 
you know, generation is coal, and yet their air is super clean, then you start whittling away at the presumptions. Because until they actually get educated, until the energy IQ is raised, they're susceptible to the spin gamut. Yeah, you know, yes, as a matter of physics and energy density, it's not going to be a 100% renewable fix. But what we've got to do is actually make sure that everybody understands what those words mean. And they need to understand that we actually have achieved clean, and I will say safe, because that's the right term, Clean is not definable scientifically. Safe is. We have safe air, okay? We have the safest air of anybody we trade and compete with. And we have done it with energy, not despite it. And that is the campaign. Everybody needs to champion the role that energy plays, not just in lifting people out of poverty, but in actually modernizing, making our economy successful so that we can afford to install these things. Because half of the global problem is just the indoor air pollution problem, which goes away as soon as you electrify or move LNG or LPG, right? It's all of the above, but it can't, you know, well, it, domestically it's just got to be a, my view is it's a three prong. You have to remind them that eliminating US CO2 emissions does nothing unless we're playing a technology lead, right? Two, we're a shining example to the world, stop apologizing and start leading. That's the words I use. And three, stop exporting jobs and importing pollution. These pollutants are international. Mercury travels internationally in the stratosphere. PM drifts internationally across the Pacific Ocean. This is not, even for the xenophobes, this is not a hard sell. We just have to make an effort. So the answer ultimately is we have to keep making videos. Each of these institutions, these great pieces of research know-how needs to play a role in celebrating. I mean, you kind of have to create, pardon my use of my kids' phrase, a couple of cheesy videos before people start paying attention. Other questions? One more. Yeah, one more. Paul? Um, Mike, thanks for doing these videos. These are great, and it uh, brings me back to when uh, uh, I went into the classroom and my kids, I have two boys, 9-11, and I went into my son's third year, uh, third grade classroom a couple years ago, and it just dawned on me how much we as an industry, the energy industry, have ceded the high ground to the environmental community. So I went in there, talked about coal, talked about everything in a Boulder County, Colorado classroom, and all the teachers were like, this is great, I didn't know this existed. You know, and, and so my question to you is, are you going to do more videos that kind of focus kind of on that K through 12 spectrum and you know, just getting them wet while they're young? It's great, great question. I have, I've had the same experience in classrooms um, and there's a long list, I'm sure everybody's got it. And I, I, one thing I'll say is that actually is meaningful engagement. Yeah. I mean, everybody here probably is engaged in their kids or their nephews or nieces or grandkids. Keep doing it because I, I, I have friends in the environmental community the teachers in Austin, Texas are not conservatives, okay? <laughs> we are all in this together. We're human beings trying to save lives, right? And so the more they know that's what your mission is, the more they listen. It's not shilling for industry if you're doing things that some members of industry don't want to do. But everybody in this room seems to be violently in agreement about it, right? So the answer is yes. I can't talk about all the things because some of, there are actually some federal projects going on that are going to be some basic curriculum. But this is a little plug. Teacher workshops, engagement with teachers, give them materials. It, does, it, has to be, it has to be right down the middle. It doesn't need to be spin. It's great. Cole's the only thing. That's not what anybody needs. That's not what anybody would do. And, and they need to understand that we're giving them real scientific stuff. We just had developed, Life Power just developed an actual curriculum that's been approved by the Texas Education Agency to talk about energy, everything, renewable, oil, gas, coal, the whole spiel. The only question on the standardized test in Texas, Texas, three years ago about energy was, which causes global warming? Oil, natural gas, coal, or all of the above? That's Texas. That ain't even test anymore, by the way. And the test is more about actually teaching the kids the building blocks so they can make up their own minds. Our kids don't need to be preached to. I think we all know that, right? They need to be educated. And that is going to be the future of America. I hate to be too you know, cheesy about it, but 
Unfortunately, videos is how they take in so much of their information that we all need to figure out a way to communicate at that level. So the state can be doing more, universities can be doing more, um, curriculum based, your associations, you know, the Texas Association has a huge work, teacher workshop program. It's joining together with all the other industry groups to join that curriculum together. And you know, that's, that's, some of this, that's, that's a long game, but it's an important one. I'm glad you asked the question. Thank you everybody for the time and keep up the good work. Thanks, Mike. Um, and I think this provides sort of a chance for me to sort of tie some themes together. You know, this, this isn't the day and a half of presentations. This isn't supposed to be little chunks of things. It's supposed to sort of paint this broader picture and hopefully help folks understand kind of the philosophy of the state, why we're doing what we're doing. And, you know, this morning, you know, Governor really fantastic is sort of painting his vision as somebody who's been on the job for three months. You know, and then we had uh, some folks coming in talking about renewable projects, and certainly renewables do play a role. And um, but you know, this one size fits all concept, especially in energy, just does not work. And I think we're finding that a realization of that in some of the policies that we're seeing across the country. You know, um, 20 years ago it was all about renewable fuel standards. You know, 20% by 2020, 30% uh, by 2030, those types of things. But now, as we're seeing, uh, you know, very conservative states like California and now Colorado, you know, as they're going to 50% or higher levels of renewable or low carbon standards, um, their carbon capture plays a role. They recognize that they cannot meet the, the zero emissions or, or lower carbon emission standards that they want to see without carbon capture being a part of that. So if you look really closely at some of the new policies, it's not a renewable fuel standard, it's a low carbon standard. And I think that creates policy opening for a lot of these technologies that we're talking about, our announcement this morning. You know, looking forward, using the intellectual capital and the wealth of the United States to be that leader, to develop these technologies that can be deployed worldwide. Um, earlier this week, I was working on a presentation for next week and, and did a little bit of research. And of the 30 countries in the world that have the highest uh, numbers or levels of coal reserves, recoverable coal reserves, only 10 of them are considered to be first world countries. So you have 20 countries with enormous coal reserves that somehow we're not expecting them or going to allow them to use their own natural resources to lift their countries out of poverty. How, I mean, it's just, it's crazy to think that we would do that. But the better pathway forward is to develop these things here in the United States that can then be deployed elsewhere. So that sort of leads me into my, our next speaker, Randy Eminger, with the Energy Policy Network. And Randy has been doing a lot of work in uh, large coal-consuming states about how to you know, keep those fleets viable as long as possible. And the role that that plays in technology development is you actually have to have a robust or a thriving, healthy coal industry in the United States to develop these technologies. Because at some point, there's a tipping point. And I don't know what that is, but if we keep seeing the level of plant closures that we do, at some point, utilities are gonna just see it as a sunk cost, we will depreciate these things out, and we're not gonna move forward. So, you know, what can we do to keep, this, keep these plants operating, add additional technologies to develop this technology to be deployed elsewhere? Because every credible international study, whether it's the IPCC or the BP does an energy statistical review. They all show coal use growing globally. That may not be the case domestically, but it is the case globally. So, you know, let's use that leadership role. And uh, really pleased that Randy is going to join us today and talk about some of the activities that they've been working on. Um, we've, we've been a partner with them for a few years now. So, with that, Randy, the floor is yours. So I have, uh, Mike and I have been on a number of panels together around, and we seem to run into each other a lot. And I always compare whenever I have to follow Mike, 
And it's like the rock band going first and then the backup band coming on after the rock band's over. So now that Elvis has left the building, <laughs> you have the backup band. I'm very pleased to be here today. And again, Energy Policy Network, primarily what we do is we work in the states. So I'm going to bring this down from a global level to a state level as to what we're doing individually in states to uh, promote coal fuel power plants that use Wyoming coal. And that's, that's the focus of the Energy Policy Network. Uh, I don't represent Eastern Coal or, or any other state besides Wyoming Coal. A little bit of uh, a little good news and a little bad news to start off with. Last year, 2018, Wyoming sold 196 million metric tons to 133 power plants in 27 states. The negative part of that, in 2018, that one year, 15 coal fuel power plants were closed. In the next five years, announced another 27 coal fuel power plants will be closed. Another way to look at that, the chart by pie, pie chart on the left really shows the power plants, 133. As you can tell, some of them are smaller plants that are gonna be closing, but in one year, 15 of those closed, another 27. And then if you look at the right-hand side of this Powder River Basin coal again, uh, you, will, you looked at a loss of nine and a half million tons of coal in 2018 from generation that closed another 36.5 is looking at closing in the next five years. This is the negative. We have some positive to go with that. Hopefully um, what we do at EPN basically is we look at trying to stop the early closure of coal fuel power plants. We don't do it in Wyoming. Our mission is to look at coal consuming states in the Midwest and the South, those states that consume the coal uh, from from the state of Wyoming. We, we are strictly PRB related. Again, uh, we, uh, we don't have membership. We really just operate strictly off of donations. A little bit about what we do. Uh, this was in January of last year. Uh, Michael Bloomberg, $64 million contributed to Sierra Club's Beyond Coal campaign. Uh, that brought his total up to $168 million that he's contributed uh, to this single campaign. I can't go into all of it, don't have time, but to try to bring us up a little bit up to date, but they're just really to say that we're really outfunded, tremendously outfunded, but we're been, we've been able to make some real dents and some real progress with the amount of funds that we're allowed. Again, when we go into a state, first we have to decide which power plants we're going to try to go in and defend how we're going to defend them, we do the economic research, we make sure they have environmental controls on them, are they clean or not, are they old, are they, uh, are they young, uh, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, what we do also is build a broad-based coalition within the state. Uh, we usually look to the industrial customers, we look to the labor unions, we look to consumer groups that are interested in keeping the price of electricity low, um, and that sort of thing. We, we do the research, uh, we build a regulatory team. I have a great lead attorney, actually is with Jackson Walker, the same law firm that Mike works for, and Megan Griffith is an excellent lead attorney for us. We have Charles Griffey, who's our technical expert, former senior vice president for Houston Light Power over regulatory and planning. He knows inside out an integrated resource plan and rate making. We, we uh, intervene, we litigate if we have to, we don't like to, it's very expensive. And then of course we institute grassroots and media campaigns within the states as well. So a lot of my job, unfortunately, is dealing with attorneys that uh, we use to, to, to engage in each of these uh, situations. I'm gonna kind of bring three and a half years worth of work into 10 minutes here if I can. We started out in Oklahoma. In this case, we were supporting Oklahoma Gas and Electric that wanted to keep their coal plant going. Uh, they would have to put a scrubber on that plant. Uh, they were opposed by the gas industry, the wind industry, Sierra Club that wanted to close the plant down instead of put the controls on. Uh, we, we built a coalition, electric co-ops. We had large industrial railroads, uh, consumer group, 
and we uh, went to work on trying to save this plant. Now the reason it was tough, you would think, well, you're working with the electric utility, it should have been easy to get approval. This was the third time they had been in to get approval from the Public Utility Commission in Oklahoma. First two times they were denied. So this was the last chance by the Apple to get this plant to continue to run. We did win that, um, case two to one. Uh, it was, of course, as you can see there, 13 years of additional life for the Sooner Power Plant in Oklahoma that, that uses PRV coal. Uh, next, we went uh, in Arkansas. These are two huge plants, over uh, 1,600 megawatts apiece, uh, that the EPA had issued a, this is the Obama EPA, issued a BIP, Federal Implementation Plan, that would have caused $2 billion worth of scrubbers and other controls to be put on these plants. Um, we came in, of course, Entergy, the one that owns the plants, had stated we can't afford the $2 billion, so we're going to look at a settlement. Um, in that settlement, they settled with EPA and, and the Sierra Club for looking at closing the plant in 2024, 2025. Uh, we went to work educating the governor, the attorney general, the environmental agency who said they're not violating any environmental uh, problems. They were meeting regional hate goals in that state. Long story short, we ended up uh, with the attorney general uh, in the state and we joined in with that lawsuit. Uh, Leslie Rutledge, she was very good, very helpful in uh, filing the suit against the EPA uh, in this case. We ended up winning that suit. We ended up allowing uh, the uh, state agency, the Arkansas Department of Environmental Quality, uh, came out with a new state implementation plan that was approved by the new EPA that's in place now. The key to this, and is really the, the thing that is most interesting, is that underlying, we were, we were able to convince the state agency that low sulfur coal equal best available retrofit technology, BART, for regional haze in this case. So instead of putting $2 billion worth of scrubbers on, they had to guarantee that they would use coal that had 0.6 pounds of it sulfur per MMBTU. As long as they stayed the low sulfur, 0.6 and below, that was considered the controls that were in compliance, did not have to put the scrubbers on these units again. We're looking at 18 years of additional life to these power plants, eight and a half million tons of coal uh, between two of them annually, all of it BRB. The life of the white blood plant is now 2028, and independence is 2040, that's natural life. That's out there. Now, I'm not saying that EPM did these things totally on our own. I don't want to take claim for everything that's been done here. But we built the coalition, we built uh, the situation. If, if we hadn't have interjected ourselves, there would not have been the opposition that there was to closing these plants down. Uh, Louisiana, we had a similar situation. Sierra Club had sued uh, Entergy again on the Nelson plant uh, to close it down in 2025. We were able to go to the environmental agency and talk to them about low sulfur coal, low sulfur coal. Uh, equaling BART in Arkansas. They took that and ran with it. A new state implementation plan. And again, we ended up with a situation where uh, under the new state SIP and the new EPA, we ended up with a low sulfur cold equaling BART. No need to put scrubbers on the Nelson plant in Louisiana. Currently, we're in battle in Indiana. And you might say, well, why Indiana? That's East, but actually you're sending PRV coal all the way to Indiana, even though there's coal mined in the southern part of the state. So we, um, we are now working uh, with a coalition. Uh, NIPSCO, the utility there, is looking at closing Sierra, uh, the uh, Schaefer and the Michigan City plant. Uh, both of those in 21 and 2023 and the other in 2028. These plants have all the bells and whistles on them. They have all the controls. They're midlife, most of them are 35 to 40 years old, so there's a lot of life left in them. Uh, and that's our, where we're engaging now. 
we have actually uh, built a coalition in the state of labor unions. Uh, Georgia Pacific has a wallboard plant that is connected to the Schaefer plant. So if the Schaefer plant goes away, they lose their fly ash, which they use in their, in their byproducts for their wallboard plant. So we have uh, some of the other companies that have joined in. Of course, the counties, a lot of times, that are going to lose a lot of money if the power plant goes away, uh, will join our coalition as well. Uh, we've got a grassroots and PR campaign going forward, earn media, letters to the governor, uh, letters to the editor, that sort of thing. We've run some newspaper ads. We'll continue to do that. Uh, the intervention in the, uh, will take place April 16th through 18th, which will be the oral testimony. And of course, the Public Utility Commission will make a decision probably in May, late May, early June. Um, we're expecting good things in this battle as well. Uh, we do sit down with the utility and do settlement talks, just as all the other parties. The environmental groups will sit down with the utility and do settlement talks. We are as well. We feel very encouraged that we're going to get extended life on at least the shape of plant that was uh, expected to close in 2023. We feel good about that. Um, so those negotiations can continue to go forward uh, as we uh, also get ready for the regulatory battle that we're going to have coming up before the Public Utility Commission in Indiana. Uh, those two plants, we would have an additional 16 years, 15 uh, 0.3 million metric tons of PRB coal saved. Uh, one of the interesting things in Indiana is we have basically taken the, taken the legislation that passed in Wyoming recently on the selling of a power plant uh, and put it into our requirements and demands in Indiana. So on these two plants, part of our requirements uh, for NEBSCO is to offer to sell these plants to someone else and we use the same language that passed in Wyoming in, in SF-159. So that is already spreading to other states. One of the things I will look at and, and kind of go over quickly, again, uh, we can't take claim for all of the victory here, but we were very much a part of it. Looking at the four power plants that we were engaged in over the last three years, it's uh, in the year's extension, we're looking at 123 million metric tons of coal. Uh, with a little help from Jason back of the envelope to tell me the tax situation or the tax structure in the state of Wyoming, and I'm not an accountant or a financial person at all, tax person, but when you look at the major taxes, the severance tax, you look at the minerals royalties tax, uh, you look at the other taxes associated with abandoned mines and Gross, uh, gross proceeds, uh, and you filter down the number of years and the number of tons uh, saved, you're looking at about $48 million uh, in tax revenue. I feel on the low end for the state on an annual basis, and over the 40-year additional life, you're looking at a, about $478 million uh, additional, uh, I wouldn't just say additional funding, but saving some funds that might have been lost had we not been there. Uh, that's a quick overview of what we do and why we do it. Uh, that's Lumpy the Coal Man. We again are in favor of new technologies and working with the DOE on a, on a, a CCUS project in Southern Colorado. And we recently got the governor of Arkansas to sign on to $50,000 to do a CCUS study in that state as well. So we're all about keeping coal fuel power plants going. Uh, if we can add new technology to it, for that reason, we're all on board with that. That's basically what the uh, house band has to say. If there's uh, any questions, I'd be more than happy to, to answer them. I will say after Indiana, we're probably looking in a month or two uh, heading to Michigan. So that's probably going to be our next, next battle. Thank you. Very good. Thanks, Randy.